Praise the Lord. It's wonderful to be with you all here and wherever you are. It's a great privilege and an honor to share with God's people and any people anywhere. Because when you live your life and you get to about my age, you suddenly realize that life is precious, that life is unique, that life is something very, very spectacular actually. And it's fascinating to go around. I've been to many countries, probably about over 30 countries in the world. And it's fascinating to see that everywhere you go, there's human beings. And they're all different. I've been looking for one that looks like me, but I haven't found one yet. So I'm very unique. There's only one of me and there's only one of you. And as I shared this morning about pursuing your purpose... I really hope that the Holy Spirit will just hit you with one or two little nuggets that will open you up to just get a hold of what it means to do that, to pursue your purpose in life. Maybe we should just pray first. Should we do that? Let's pray. Father, we just praise you and thank you this morning. We ask you by the power of your Holy Spirit to be with us and to release your anointing into our lives wherever we are, whoever we are, you know us. And we thank you for that. Thank you that you can speak to us and touch our lives this morning. And we can go on in our lives not being the same in 10 or 15 minutes time. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to take a, a portion of scripture in Romans chapter 12. And I'm not going to read it all because then it takes a long time and I get sucked into the scriptures very easily. As I start reading them, I just start getting so captured by one or two words and what God is saying that I go off at tangents all over the place. And it's so exciting and I'm not going to apologize for it. I used to, when I first got saved at 24 years old, and I used to spend a lot of time apologizing because I was so excited about God and so excited about Jesus and Jesus saved me. And now I'm so excited about it. When I speak, you'll think there's something wrong with this guy. He's so excited about Jesus. You know? He's so excited about salvation. And I just like bubble out all the time. And then I'll be talking in this direction and suddenly change to this and suddenly change to that. And that's what happens when you're excited about something. You kind of like, whatever you're doing, or if you're telling somebody about something new that has happened, you say, did you see this? Did you notice that? And what about this? And, and they say, like, slow down, just calm down. Tell us what happened, you know. But when you're excited about something, it shows that you're passionate about it too. Now, it was interesting a, a couple of weeks ago, as you're pursuing your purpose, You've got to get some basics right or you'll never, ever be satisfied in your life. Whether you're a Christian or not, you'll never be satisfied. And I can make a point of there's many people that have lots of money, lots of things, and they actually might even be doing everything within their framework of their giftings and talents. And yet they are so frustrated and they go and do stuff that you just cannot believe and wreck their lives, okay? And I can give you an example of a person like Maradona, one of the greatest, they say he would have been better than Pele and would have been the greatest football player of all time. But at the age of 27 years old, he started taking drugs and getting into drugs and actually destroyed his greatest football ability, which normally kicks in when you're young, you're sort of immature and that, you're still growing. And as a, as a sports person, you normally hit your greatest time is about from 27 to 34 years old. That's when you're at your peak, you're mature, you've got a lot of wisdom in sport and you just become the greatest player that you can be. And that's what Mar Maradona destroyed in his life because of drugs and he lost the plot completely. And... Well, he, he carried on with his life. But then I'll give you the example of a guy like Kaka, okay? He, the reason he was called Kaka, C-A-C-A, -C -A, okay, was his little brother couldn't pronounce his name. 
And so that's where he got the, the nickname Kaka from. And he played for Brazil. He's one of eight players in the world that, that won the greatest prize in the soccer world, which is the World Cup for his country. And many, many, many accolades and trophies and everything. When he won the World Cup, he got fined and he got attacked by the whole world because he took his shirt off. And on his shirt it said, I belong to Jesus, you see. He unashamedly proclaims Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. With all his gifts, all his talents, and all his ability, and he's financially, he's worth probably over a hundred million dollars, but he feeds the poor, and he's involved in life everywhere. He's doing an unbelievable job, and there's a young man, he retired now at the age of about 37, but he achieved virtually everything that he could in football, but his identity was not in football. His identity was in the Lord God Almighty. You see, and that's what I want to share with you this morning, that if you don't get this right, you can never fulfill your purpose. Kaka is still, uh, he's a loving husband, he's got a family, and he's still serving God, and he's completely fulfilled. He's not depressed now because he's 37, and his mature age of sport is over. He cannot really, when you're 50, you cannot be a good sportsman anymore and compete. You can just be a coach or you can be a manager or something else. But it can be very frustrating if your whole identity is captured in what you were when you were 24. Now, I want to encourage you as Christian people, whether you're here or out there, wherever you are, don't get captured in what you were when you were 20 or what you think you are. Get captured by what the scriptures talk about purpose. Now, when you go and read Romans chapter 12, you'll find out and you'll find that there's many things in the scripture that lead us to a couple of clear, clear, clear cut conclusions. And the first one is this. What were you made for as a human being? What were you made for? Why did God make you? And it's very clear because when they asked Jesus even, he said to them, the first commandment is a number one thing. You were made to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the first principle of pursuing your purpose and getting it right. If you don't put that in perspective, you, all the rest doesn't matter. It's not going to work. And then Jesus said the second is as important or the same as the first. And now that tells us that, well, what's that? He said, love others as you love yourself. Wow. As you love the Lord. So you put God first and then you understand that you were born for a purpose and that purpose is to mingle, to mix and to be a part of other people's lives. You cannot be a loner and do it by yourself. You'll never, ever be satisfied. You'll never be fulfilled. And then what kicks in after that is, now, what about all your giftings and your talents? Yeah. What about that? Well, in Romans chapter 12, it says, I want to just read this. It says, renew your mind so that you can prove. God actually challenges us to prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of the Father. So when somebody says, prove this, if somebody says to you, or you say to somebody, I can jump 1.5 meters high, they say to you, prove it, what do they do? They go and get a hard jump set, and they set it all up, and they put the bar at 1.5, and they say, come jump over this. And until you jump over it, you haven't proved you can jump it. Don't jump under the bar. Have you seen some of those guys, they run and they jump under the bar. But it's, it's all very good to stand. I can stand here and say, do you know that I could jump 1.85 meters? I used to be able to actually. I was the third highest high jumper in my high school. Third, because I was short. 
I was the shortest guy in grade 12, but the third highest high jumper. You know? But let me tell you something, that if I told you that I can jump 1.8 meters, none of you would believe me. I would, yeah, some people are shaking their head, I don't believe that. You see, you would have to have proof, and I would prove it to you. And I would say, right, bring that set now, set up the bar at 1.8 meters, and I will run along. Me, not my son, not somebody I've called and said, will you jump for me? You say, ah, you're a con artist. I want to see you jump, isn't it? And when I run and I jump over, you all say, he did it. He did it. Brad Palmer did that. And you'll go to somebody else and you'll say, Brad Palmer can jump 1.8 meters. And, you, and they'll say, that guy, you're crazy. You say, I saw it. You see. So when God is saying, prove my perfect, my good, my acceptable will for your life. God is actually telling us, come on now, as a Christian person, let's go and do it. Let's go and prove it. Now, how do we prove that? We go and do it. Now, I really want to encourage you in this because so many people that get frustrated in life, they get disappointed, they get disgruntled, they, they, they're like negative about everything. I mean, what a way to live. I, I think it must be a terrible thing to get up every day and think, oh, why am I getting up today? Have you ever had one of those days where you wake up in the morning and say, should I get up? Shouldn't I? What am I going to do today? Huh? Nobody has those days. Only me. <laughs> you see, when you've got nothing to do, when you've got nothing passionate about something, then you can be like that. I was telling you, I was talking to somebody and they involved, they're a married couple and they're involved in the ministry and Christian school and it's difficult. You have staff issues, you have parent issues, you have children issues. You have all kinds of challenges when you work with humanity and especially if you work with children and parents and, and you've got facilities and you've got lockdowns and you've got COVID-19 and you've got all kinds of issues. So it's not like their life is awesome and everything is just fine. But I was communicating with this couple and I said to them, thank you for all that you do for the Lord. And the, they, they replied back to me and they said, we love, it's only our pleasure, we love what we do. Do you love what you do? Only one head nodded. <laughs> oh, Jesus help us. <laughs> you know, how many people out there in the world, if you said to them, how's your life, how's it going, do you love what? what you do, would they stand up and say, I love what I do. And I'll tell you why you have a problem if you don't love what you do. There's a fundamental problem in your life if you don't love what you do. If you get up every day and you don't passionately love living, here's the problem. Are you ready? You're not going to like my answer, but it's the truth. You do not love God enough. You haven't put God so passionate into your heart and into your mind that you love him so much that you actually understand that he's given you every day as a gift to live. And when you put God first like that and you just love God, so many people come and I've counseled many, many people and they're so frustrated because they want God to show up for their plan for their life. Not God's plan for their life, their plan for their life. You see, when you love God passionately, everything inside of you changes. Your very day, your very waking up in the morning is because you love Him. So you get up because you love Him. Now it doesn't matter what you have to do in that day, you do it well and you do it with passion why? Because you understand you're doing it for the Father that you love. It changes everything. And then when you get up like that and you say, wow, 
Second thing is God wants me to be involved with people. People are not the problem anymore. Bring all the problem people. I remember talking to somebody that was working with lots and lots of people and saying, I'm so tired of people and all their problems. I said, aren't you a counselor? Can you imagine being a psychologist and a professional counselor and, you know, everyone comes for you to counseling and you hate counseling people. I think you're in the wrong profession. You might have the degree for counseling, but you shouldn't be counseling. Because if you're doing that, you should love what you do. Otherwise, I don't want to go to anyone who doesn't love what they're doing. I remember when I was in the UK once, you know, and I love steam trains and, and those kind of things. So I went to this one place where there was, the, there was a steam train there and a little train that you could ride and stuff. So I went along there. And while I was there, I was walking around, checking out the whole place, and I thought, wow, there's some restoration going on here. So I went into this one section where they're all working, and there was about five or six old guys, not young like me. (laughs) They were like 80 and above. I think the youngest was 81 years old. One of them was even 87 years old. And I went there, and I'm chatting to them, and I'm saying, like, guys, what are you guys doing here? I said, no, we're restoring this carriage. And there was a carriage there. It's about 10 meters long and about two and a half meters wide. And really, it looked like a piece of rubbish. You know? It looked like an old junk thing. And then they're telling me, no, this is an 1825 carriage, one of the first train carriages ever made in the world of this type. And they're going to restore it. Well, I immediately thought madness. Madness. Just use it for firewood. Beautiful old. It's made out of oak and all kinds of stuff. But it's wrecked. I mean, there's rotten wood. There's rusty bolts. I thought, man, how long will it take you to restore this? I asked them. I said, well, we estimate four to five years, six of us working on it every day. I said, I think they are passionate about fixing a piece of rubbish. You understand what I mean? And these old guys, they come there every single day through winter, through summer. It's freezing cold in the UK. There's nothing worse than being out in some yard. And they put a tent over it and a heater. You see, they're so passionate about restoring an old railway coach that they'll put a tent over it, they'll put a heater there, and they'll go there every single day for five years of their life, scraping bits of iron and bits of wood and undoing old bolts and refurbishing and putting them back together. What does that tell you? i tell you what it told me about those five or six old guys. They're totally fanatical about an old railway coach. That's what it told me. Now, when we're Christians, I can tell those that are passionate and are completely overwhelmed and in love with the Lord, they're involved in the Lord's work. They just can't help being involved because as you love God, so all your abilities and things just begin to open up for you. There's a scripture in the Bible that says, Your gift will make a way for you. You see, so when you know, you put God first, you you know that you need to work with the family of God. Now, whatever your talents are, whether you're going to be a lawyer, whether you're investment, whether you're a fireman, whether you're a counselor, whether you're a musician, whether you're a teacher, it does not matter what abilities you have. Remember that God put those things in you in the first place. He put them in you. He gave you those gifts and talents. Guess what they're for? Not for you. Because he wants you to be an instrument in the body of Christ first and in the world. And now all your gifts, all your talents, all your abilities become alive and start working When you love God, you get involved with the people of God first and the world, 
And now all those gifts and talents that he has inside of you, they just begin to start coming alive, coming alive. If you're supposed to be singing, I wish I could sing. When I sing, everyone leaves. So I don't sing. And I have the maturity to understand that I do not have a singing ability. It doesn't make me depressed. It doesn't make, it makes me, I have to watch, I don't get jealous. When I see someone like Amy worshipping and singing and Rachel, I think, oh, I wish I could sing. I make a joyful noise. So when I sing, they all say, quiet, please, you're out of tune and everything else. So I have to be content with, I don't have the music gift. There's many gifts I don't have. And it's an absolute privilege and a blessing for me to know people in the body of Christ and I just grab the gift off them. If I need a singer, I'll get a singer. If I need a lawyer, I'll get a lawyer. If I need an investment person, I'll get the investment person. If I need a builder, I'll get the. If I need a project manager, I'll manage the project. You see, but I cannot do everything and none of us can. But together, as you read Romans chapter 12, you'll find that it speaks of the body. Just read the whole thing through and you'll see that it speaks of the body and each one has to play its part in the body. Now, there's no competition in the body. Have you ever had your nose telling you, I'm better than the eye? Have you ever had your big toe saying to you, I'm the king of the castle, yeah, you listen to me. The only time it kind of happens is when you injure yourself. Have you ever injured yourself? It's an amazing thing. I like running about 8 to 10 10 kilometers every day, and I'm enjoying my running. But the other day, a tiny little muscle, just right in the middle of my calf, it's about two inches long. How do I know that? Because I can feel it. You know? And it goes into a funny little spasm. And one little muscle, two meters long, prevents my whole body. I can't even run 100 meters. In fact, I can't even walk properly. If I'm walking, you'll say, oh, he's limping. That's right, because a two-inch, uh, a, two a 50-centimeter little muscle decided it's not going to work together with the rest of the body. You see, when the body works together, it is powerful. It is amazing. And when we put our father first and we get involved in the body, now we let our different talents. Listen, Graham plays the violin. Can you imagine playing the violin? I think it must be awesome. I would love to play the violin. I wish I could play the trumpet. There's so many things I wish I could do. God has not given me that ability. And I could spend the rest of my life wishing what I couldn't do instead of getting on and doing what I can do and understanding he did not give me the music ability. He doesn't want me to be involved in the music field, but I can. You know, I can financially support the music field. Now, here's the last point I want to leave you with. As you have these gifts and talents, do you really want to fulfill and to find that unbelievable satisfaction in your purpose? This is when it happens, is when you take those gifts and talents, first you love God with all your heart. Then you understand you need to work with people and some of them are painful, irritating and some of them you wish you never saw or met in your life but it's okay because you understand you must work with them. Then you take the gifts and abilities that God has placed within you and you let them loose on those same people. Firstly in the body of Christ. You let them loose. So if God has blessed you, he wants you to be a businessman, okay? And he blesses you financially. You become totally, totally fulfilled when you take the financial blessing and don't buy your seventh hearth and your 25th car and your 17th Mercedes Benz and so you go. No, you take your financial blessing and you begin to bless and use it in the kingdom of God. Because everything that God has given us is for 
the building of his kingdom. Not our kingdom, his kingdom. So get involved in building the kingdom. If you're the singer, well, sing with all your heart. Um, go, before you come and sing, don't get complacent, you know. When you can get so complacent about things. And if you're like in the praise and worship group, you know, well, you show up on Sunday because it's the right thing to do. And you show up in your boring, stagnated mind. No, you should be so fired up every single day when it comes to, wow, I'm going to church to be in praise and worship. Thank you, Jesus. I'm flowing in my talents and my gifts. I've got an opportunity to just do what I'm supposed to do, what you created me to do. And when I sing on the stage here, or wherever I'm singing, I'm going to sing and the people will just feel my love for you. You see, when we take our talents and our gifts and we present ourselves to God like that, the Bible says, as we love the Lord, he will draw men to himself. He'll draw men. You, you, you want a revolution of righteousness. You want the church full to capacity. Just start loving God. Love him so much. And you know what? You can't help tell your, your neighbor about Jesus when you love God. You can't help it. Wherever you go, you can't even walk into the pie shop and buy pie. If you're so in love with the Lord, you buy your pie and you're already telling the person about Jesus. You know that? You just can't help it. And then if you're a teacher, you're just teaching the children. You love teaching the children. Oh, some of them you want to kill some days, you know. But you're already grown in that ability to understand that this is what I'm called to do. I'm loving God. I'm working with people. And I just get on and do it and get on and do it in a passionate, amazing way. And as you take your gift, here's a thing. Here's a thing. You want to be a better singer. You want to be a better teacher. You want to get more money as a financial person. You want to have more influence. Take it and give it to God. And when you are faithful in what he has given you, he will increase. He will increase. He'll increase your exposure. He'll increase what he has for you to do. So as you take what he's given to you, release it. Don't hold on to it. And let it go. And watch what happens. You'll have an increase taking place, and you'll be more and more blessed in your life. So I hope I left you with a few things to think about today and I'm looking forward to testimonies from you as you just go out there, you know, and do what you need to do. But keep God first, keep working with people and loving the people second and then developing your talents and gifts by using them in the kingdom of God. Amen. Let's close and pray. Father, we praise you and thank you. We can pursue the very purpose that you have for us. That is your will and plan for us. Lord, as we read in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, help us to prove that which is your good, acceptable, and perfect will for our lives. Truly, it is our desire to go after your perfect will and plan for us. Help us, Lord, not to hold back, but to go after what you have for us with everything within us. Help us to have more passion for you than for anything else that we see or can obtain in this world. Thank you that we can do that. In Jesus' name, amen.